Watch out! This sign could mean that you're about to become diabetic soon. In this video, I'm going to tell you seven signs and symptoms that can show up before a diabetes diagnosis at the pre-diabetes stage. A lot of people ask me if pre-diabetes is real. And the answer is yes, it's a stage that we can't quite characterize or define as diabetes, but it's not normal either. But this stage can have several consequences. And I'm going to explain that to you in this video, and then I'll go over the numbers with you. And how's it done? The diagnosis of diabetes and also of prediabetes. What are the values on the test? But let's start first with the signs and symptoms. The first sign that can show up before diabetes is these marks on the skin. Right here, this change called acrocordin. I'll put the detailed photo right here so it's much easier for you to clearly see. This noticeable change in the skin, specifically the acrocordins, they are very closely related to insulin resistance. And quite often, when you are truly about to become diabetic, what exactly happens then? There's a failure in glucose metabolism. You produce insulin, but the body just can't take the sugar in your blood and move it into the cells, into the muscles. Because even though you produce insulin, sometimes even in excess, a lot of insulin, that insulin doesn't work the way it should. That's the process of insulin resistance. And this is linked to type 2 diabetes. Prediabetes is the stage that can come before type 2 diabetes. It's really important to mention this. Because type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. It's the body itself that produces autoantibodies that attack the beta cells in the pancreas, which produce insulin. So it's different. Even though it's also diabetes and raises blood sugar levels, the disease happens through a different mechanism. It's important to know this in order to prevent it. Since type 2 diabetes is, in most cases, 90% of cases, and some studies even say up to 95% type 2 diabetes, it's important to pay attention if you have these signs, or if you know someone who has these signs, called acrocordons. It's important to get tested to find out if you have any changes in your glucose metabolism, if you're becoming diabetic, or even if you already are diabetic. They've already developed it because about 20% of people with prediabetes will become diabetic within five years, a short period of time. So it's really important to take action at this point. And it's also very interesting and quite curious that people who have the skin change in the photo get worried. They wonder if it could turn into cancer or if it could be a malignant tumor. And the answer is no. This specific change here, although it's related to a potentially serious disease like diabetes, does not turn into cancer. It doesn't spread throughout the body to other organs. It doesn't cause metastases, to put it more simply. So you don't need to be afraid of cancer in this case, but you should be concerned about your blood sugar levels because those can also have consequences. And the second sign, and this one is also quite interesting and often present in prediabetes, is reactive hypoglycemia. What do you mean? Hypoglycemia means low blood sugar levels. What does that have to do with prediabetes? Because at this stage, when the body's going through changes, often when you eat a meal high in carbohydrates or sugars, your pancreas can have an exaggerated response. After eating, about an hour to two hours later, this can show up as very low blood sugar, which is called reactive hypoglycemia. This can be a sign of prediabetes, as you saw the changes that happen in the pancreas and insulin production, in fact, sometimes even in excess. When you eat carbohydrates and your body can't control it, it leads to signs and symptoms afterward. Symptoms like trembling, sweating, feeling cold, and sometimes even mental confusion. Tachycardia, which is a rapid heartbeat. Palpitations, it feels like your heart is in your throat. You can really feel your heart beating. So hypoglycemia is never normal. That's the message I want to get across here. You always need to investigate why it's happening. Because there is also hypoglycemia caused by an insulin-producing tumor. So it's necessary to differentiate between these causes. For example, when we have what's called an insulinoma, the body, especially when fasting without eating, like when you wake up, not after eating, will show symptoms. This type of hypoglycemia is usually more frequent, so that's one of the differences. 
Why is that? When we have a tumor that produces insulin and you don't eat, you don't have carbohydrates, your blood sugar drops. And this type I'm talking about, which can be a sign of prediabetes, happens when you eat food and then have this response. So that's another difference. What I strongly suggest, since I mentioned that hypoglycemia, low blood sugar levels, is never normal. I suggest you check for sure with a glucose meter, a glucometer, so you can really know if that's what's happening. Because if it is, you need medical help. A lot of times, people have the false idea that they're experiencing hypoglycemia because symptoms like mental confusion and shaking can be caused by other conditions. So it's important for you to check this first. That way, we can take action and investigate in the best way possible. But what if I fast? Four or five hours, for example? Is it normal to have low blood sugar levels and hypoglycemia? And the answer is no. Do you remember what I said? Hypoglycemia is never normal because our body has mechanisms to prevent hypoglycemia. That's why many people can go days without eating sometimes because of this, because the body has these mechanisms. If there is any failure or disease causing this, that disease needs to be addressed. And one of them could be a sign of diabetes or even a tumor itself. An insulin producing tumor needs to be identified. You have a much greater chance of a cure if this disease is identified early. And the third sign of prediabetes, and this one is also related to insulin resistance, which is a skin manifestation called acanthosis nigricans. And this sign here is very common. Have you ever seen someone on the street with this sign? I'll also put a picture here to make it easier to identify. There are those dark velvety patches in the folds of the skin, sometimes in the armpit, sometimes on the back. I put it on the neck here so you can see it more clearly. This can mean insulin resistance, and it's a stage that comes before diabetes. Sometimes the person already has changes in their blood sugar levels and has these patches. Remember that there are other rarer causes that can also lead to acanthosis nigricans, like tumors in the esophagus, for example, or in the digestive tract, which can also cause this, but that's more rare. By far, the most common cause is insulin resistance. Why is that? When insulin increases, our skin also has receptors, and there can be a stimulus for these patches to appear. So be very careful. If you have these changes, if you have these spots, or if you know someone who does, you can let that person know. Because it's really necessary to check how your glucose metabolism is doing, to see if you have prediabetes or even diabetes. This is very important. In sign number four, this one is also really interesting. You can see that prediabetes has a series of changes that often go unnoticed. And one of these changes is also due to the effect of the hormone insulin. In the past, we used to think that the hormone insulin only took sugar from the blood and put it inside the cells, inside the muscles. But now that's not the case. We're learning more and more about its functions in other organs. And one of these functions is precisely in the kidneys. When you have an excess of insulin, when you're going through this process of insulin resistance, you have to produce more insulin so your body can compensate for it. In the kidneys, we have a stimulus to reabsorb more sodium. And what comes along with sodium? Lar. So in prediabetes, you can have an increase in blood pressure, which is something nobody talked about until a few years ago. So high blood pressure can also be worsened because of insulin resistance, or it might even require further investigation. So if your blood pressure was well controlled or you never had high blood pressure and now your levels are starting to go up, ah, you have to check how your glucose and insulin levels are. You see how everything is interconnected, all these metabolic issues. And also because high blood pressure and diabetes share many risk factors that are similar or even the same. It's a metabolic disease and we need to assess it. If you've had a change in your blood pressure, you also need to check your blood sugar levels. And sign number five, these are changes in the heart. Why did I include this change here? Did you know that even at pre-diabetes levels, you can already have consequences like an increased risk of cardiovascular disease? an increased risk of heart attack, for example. Even if you wake up with high blood sugar, 
Not even talking about diabetic levels, which everyone knows about, but just this change, pre-diabetes levels, you can already have heart consequences, even if your glycated hemoglobin is normal. So, changes in the heart. You also need to keep track of your blood sugar levels, because pre-diabetes can already have consequences. Also, this cholesterol issue can increase cardiovascular risk, not just the risk of a heart attack, but also the risk of a stroke, also called a CVA. That's why I put a heart on the cover. You always ask about the cover, right? There are a lot of comments, like, oh, but why is that image on the cover? So that's why, because with prediabetes, you already have a cardiac risk. I want to highlight this because it's really important in order to actually take action. And prediabetes can often be reversed. Reversing prediabetes to prevent it from turning into diabetes and to avoid cardiovascular risk by taking action. Controlling blood sugar levels is really important here. Since I mentioned the term reversal, a lot of people ask if it can be cured. I don't like the term cure because it sounds like, for example, an infection you caught. You took an antibiotic and after seven days you're cured, for instance. With diabetes, that's not the case. I prefer the term reversal. Because with cure, anyone can be at risk again, so you can't really say it's cured. There's another term as well, which is remission. But remission gives more the idea of an autoimmune disease that's not active for a while and then becomes active again, which isn't the case with diabetes. It's really reversal because you reverse the risk factors and manage to improve your blood sugar levels, okay? And number six is also a skin change, which is actually the most common one, called diabetic dermopathy. I'm going to put a picture here so you can see what I'm talking about. It's a change that happens in the pretibial area, or to put it more simply, on the shins. This can happen due to vascular injury, as well as changes in healing and blood supply because of elevated blood sugar levels. And I'm going to put an asterisk here, because this change is more common when blood sugar levels are already in the diabetic range. But since it's very common, about 50% of people who, who have this change in blood sugar levels may develop it. I make a point of mentioning it, because it's the most common skin change in diabetes. Have you ever seen someone with this condition? Or maybe you have it yourself. You need to take special care with your blood sugar levels. Okay? because this can happen because of diabetes. And sign number seven, which is also very important, is a change in appetite. When we have this pre-diabetes condition, one of the things that happens to your body is actually hyperphagia. What is that? You eat more. You just finished eating and you're hungry again. It's a common sign in people who have pre-diabetes. We don't fully understand the exact mechanism yet, but there is a suspicion, because since the body can no longer make good use of the sugar from food, from carbohydrates, to get energy, the brain might stimulate you to eat more. But this isn't really clear yet. I always like to point out what is proven and what is just a suspicion. But yes, patients do report an increase in hunger. Have you ever felt that? Do you have diabetes or not? Now, let's talk about the numbers. Since I promised at the beginning that I would explain more about the diagnostic criteria for prediabetes and diabetes, I'm going to put a table here with values in milligrams per deciliter, but also with millimoles per liter, which is used in many countries. This measurement, so you can see it. There are four tests we can use to diagnose diabetes. The first test is fasting blood glucose. In this test, normal is up to 99. From 100 to 125 is prediabetes. 126 or more is diabetes. Then we can also diagnose it through the glycated hemoglobin test. Normal is up to 5.6. Prediabetes is from 5.7 to 6.4. And 6.5 or higher is diabetes. It's also possible to make the diagnosis through a test called the oral glucose tolerance test. It's also called the OGTT, which is that test you take. The fasting test, you drink a solution with 75 grams of glucose, and after two hours, you take the test again. And this result, after two hours of ingesting glucose, we have what's considered normal. Up to 139 is normal, from 140 to 199 is prediabetes, and 200 or above, that's when we have diabetes. 
Another less talked about test is the random blood glucose test. But for a diagnosis, you need to have typical symptoms of diabetes. Unlike what I mentioned before, these symptoms here are excessive thirst, excessive hunger, and as a result, you go to the bathroom a lot, wake up to urinate, experience weight loss, and fatigue. This is different from prediabetes. Did you see the numbers? For these signs to appear, the levels need to be higher, above prediabetes levels. So there is this difference. Remember that I also included millimoles per liter, so you can follow along. If you're in a country that uses these units, you'll also be able to understand this video. And it's important to explain and emphasize that a single test does not diagnose diabetes. It's important to pair it with another test or repeat the same test at a different time. Because there are tests that can give what's called a false positive. Like fasting blood glucose, there are several factors, even stress, certain moments, or infections that can skew this test. So you need to repeat it at another time or pair it with another test, and only then can you have a diagnosis, whether it's diabetes, prediabetes, or other changes in glucose metabolism. On a scale from 0 to 10, what score would you give this video? If it's a 10, I'll make more videos like this one. Also, let me know which part of the world you're watching from. I'm speaking from Porto Alegre. Did you notice that I explained about diabetes? An important factor to help you avoid diabetes is maintaining or even gaining muscle mass. There are habits you can adopt to increase your muscle mass and also to prevent its loss. After a certain age, the body starts to lose muscle mass. This can also help prevent metabolic diseases like diabetes. Do you want to know what these habits are? Then click on this video here and you'll be taken right to it. I'm sure you're going to like it. Take care.